So welcome, welcome today to this uh, to this webinar entitled "What is the Human Cost of Low Cost Bananas?" Um, I will present myself first. So my name is Kuhn Kuhn Van uh, I work for Fairtrade Belgium on PR and advocacy, and I will be your facilitator for today. Uh, Fairtrade Belgium, as you all know, is the organization in Belgium promoting fair trade label and working together with companies, public authorities, and citizens to make trade fair. So as, uh, as you see, the, the webinar is entitled, What is the Human Cost of Low-Cost Bananas? Um, and when we say human cost, we actually refer to the social costs. Um, in 2017, Fair Trade International commissioned a study by True Cost, True Price uh, on the external costs related to banana production. External costs are costs that are not reflected into the price of bananas. And in the study, there was an important distinguishing made between social and environmental costs. Social costs are costs uh, related to paying sufficient wages, uh, to providing social security, to providing healthy and safe work, workplace, to compensating over time, and etc. And as these costs actually relate to human rights, we decided to use the terminology of human costs in the title of the webinar. And now what we want to do today is actually raise awareness on these human costs, because very often they're overlooked, uh, especially in terms of uh, sustainability. And we also want to explain how fair trade is actually trying to do something about these human costs, uh, in particular related to banana production. And as a third objective, we also want to think about how we can put in place sector-wide initiatives, um, particularly in Belgium, to make sure that the banana value chain becomes more sustainable. And there's actually a momentum for, uh, for this activity. Uh, first of all, from a, from a consumer side, consumers increasingly request companies to take into account social dimensions and human costs related to, product to the production of the goods they consume. Uh, a recent study that was carried out by GFK for Fairtrade in 2021, for instance, showed that 75% of consumers find it important for companies and organizations to undertake sustainable or socially responsible business. The same study also showed that consumers consider human rights as the second most important topic in society, right after health and before the environment. And it's not just from a consumer side that we see that things are moving. Also from government side, governments increasingly want companies to take care of their impact on human rights and the environment. Uh, most of us joining here today are aware of the different due diligence processes that are going on, both at the European and the Belgian level. So this all actually relates to the fact that there's a momentum to talk about these human costs. Now, I feel like I've been taking already too much of your time. So without further ado, I want to introduce our first speakers of today, which are Marike de Peña and Paul Levens. Marike works as a director for Banelina, which is a banana cooperative in the Dominican Republic. And she's also chair of the banana network of CLAC, the producer network within the fair trade uh, system representing Caribbean and Latin American producers. Paul works for Banana Link as a policy and communications coordinator and is based in the UK. And Banana Link is, of course, well known for the excellent work they do to add to fair and equitable production and trade in bananas and pineapples. Now, we asked Marika and Paul to prepare a short presentation on current human rights risks related to banana production, each from their own perspective. Marika will take the floor first and will be followed by Paul. So, Marika, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kun. Well, I've asked to talk about the root causes behind human and environmental risk and relations, and definitely low prices on the one hand, the next slide please, and increasing cost on the other hand, climate change and a very weak bargaining power of farmers and workers to demand sustainable prices and decent salaries are main root causes uh, behind the human and environmental risk we see today in banana production. As said, bananas prices have been going down during the last decades and never have been as low as during the COVID period of 2020 and 2021. But on the other hand, prices have been increasing tremendously due to climate change, due to COVID, due to new regulations that demand uh, more investment, but also more investment in control and implementations, new sustainable practices and standards that are responding to consumer and business expectations with regards to social and environmental sustainable issues. The outcome of decreasing costs and it increasing cost and decreasing prices are human and environmental risk 
as lack of living income and wages, lack of decent and safe working and living condition, forced labor, a lack of freedom of association, an increase in the use of pesticides, decrease in, best in biodiversity, and definitely insufficient investment in climate change. Uno way said that we were able to show that simple tools as fair trade minimum prices, premium, and social and environmental standards can definitely reduce these externalities. And we have shown that with the fair trade to tools, we are able to reduce the externalities up to a 45%. Next slide. But all these human and environmental risks are interrelated. So you cannot tackle one without tackling the other. So decreasing prices and increasing costs end up in insufficient resources to cover household and farm costs, insufficient income, increase in migration, reduced investment in wages and working condition, and reduced farm investment and insufficient investment in climate change ending up with all the human environmental risks that currently are at the rise. Next, please. So what do we need to do? Definitely there is a kind of urgency. And if you have followed the press recently, we have seen that the governments are taking this up. Producers are crying out loudly because producers are touching ground and there is a need for change. Migration is at the rise. Aging farmers uh, are getting farmers are getting older. Young people are not willing to step into the agriculture. Climate change need investment. Food safety is at a risk, and the race to the bottom is leaving many victims behind. Starting with small farmers, but also with smaller businesses that are not able to compete anymore in this environment. So, what do we need to ask ourselves? Are we able to change this in a voluntary basis, based on the good will, based on the good intention towards sustainability? Definitely from a farmer's perspective, perspective we believe there's more that needs to be done. And the race to the bottom needs to change to a race to the top, a race towards a full sustainable banana. And this will require some mandatory uh, regulations. And we have some opportunities. One of the opportunities definitely is in the regulations that are currently devolved with regards to sustainable purchasing practices and sanctions if these practices are not met. There are also uh, some opportunities in the human rights and environment rights due to diligence laws and regulations. And definitely we should con consider living income and living wages as in human rights and mm -hmm need to be taken up in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But also we need to revise the existing anti-competition laws that enable certain practices that we need to prevent to be able to reach full sustainability. Next, please. So do we need to wait until these mandatory regulations are in place? and are in place in a strong way, because we also have seen that while we are discussing these regulations, regulations uh, are getting weaker. No, we don't have to wait. We need to take this up. And if you have seen the declaration of the seven ministers of agriculture that recently have been in the press, there is a need, there is an urgency. Farmers are, uh, are touching ground and many farmers are getting out of, the, of banana production because it's not sustainable anymore and they cannot survive with their families in it, starting with the smallholders. There is an opportunity. We have some tools that enable us to start. One of the tools that already have been mentioned by the seven countries is the fair trade minimum price as a reference of a price that is established to cover the cost of sustainable production and reduce the externalities. These prices are revised and based on the cost of farming. They are consulted with farmers, smallholders, bigger farms, organic farmers, conventional farmers, but they are also consulted with the industry. And definitely there is no commercial interest behind these prices for reaching 
full sustainability. Next, please. Another opportunity we have, and we need to recognize also as being a farmer ourselves, is that we need to change the way we produce bananas. We need to walk away from monoculture. We need to introduce climate-friendly technology, and we need to invest in climate change, starting with the health of the soil, reducing our water footprints, uh, and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So let's work together. We have some technical technology. We have done an net trade trade. We have very positive in, uh, outcomes of it. And we can do it together, industry with farmers, and switching the race to the bottom to the race to the top. And finally, next, please. Next slide, please. Finally, we need to invest in, in making the voice of farmers and workers stronger. We can support farmers and workers through standards. We can if, if support farmers and workers in working together with the governments, in working together with the labor movement. But definitely there is a need that farmers are getting stronger in the supply chain and are able to negotiate better prices. But there is also a need that workers are getting a stronger voice so they can negotiate better wages and working conditions. We, we definitely have some very good example with the migrant road map currently implemented in the Dominican Republic, but also supporting farmers and workers directly on the ground. So with their own efforts, they are able to support the race to the top uh, that we need to, to get into the banana trade. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marike, uh, for this interesting opening presentation, which sets the tone right. Um, now, Paul, uh, the floor is yours to compliment and give more insights. Thank you. Yes, good morning, everybody. Just to firstly introduce um, Banana Link, um, for those of you that aren't aware of um, our activities, we're a, a UK based NGO um, set up in 1996 um, and we advocate for fair and ethical practices in the export banana trade um, and in doing that work very closely with um, plantation workers, trade unions, um, with small farmers organisations, and with other organisations, including Fair Trade, who um, uh, 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 we work in partnership with to, to address many of the um, ills of the, uh, the banana trade. Um, so what I'm going to do um, right now is a very quick um, whistle stop tour. I mean, I'm essentially condensing a, 40, a usual 45 minute presentation down into five minutes for you today, just to cover some of the main areas of um, violations of human rights. We over the most important areas where people and the rights of milieu geschonden worden. There are four main areas. There are dus four domains. La, à nos yeux, donc d'abord la liberté d'association, négociation collective, les droits euh, syndicaux. Ensuite, vous avez les droits euh, genrés, euh, notamment les droits des femmes. Ensuite, euh, les revenus euh, qui doivent permettre de vivre. Euh, euh, ensuite, les conditions de travail pour les petits agriculteurs, les travailleurs et les questions de santé et de sécurité. Ça fait cinq en fait et pas quatre. Ensuite, que parlons du premier point, donc la liberté d'association et de réaliser des négociations collectives. Alors, sachez que nous travaillons, euh, enfin, suivons plutôt les travaux, notamment la publication annuelle et mondiale de la Fédération internationale des syndicats. Donc, on est dans le monde où il y a low respect pour les droits rights. Um, although I have to say that that vary, can vary from country to country um, in the banana trade. Um, and even within different countries. You might have seen, for example, a recent report about Guatemala and compared the fairly stark differences in working conditions and respect for, for, for rights on unionized plantations in Guatemala compared to the non-union plantations where workers uh, are, are working for a lot less pay, a lot longer hours and subject to a lot more abuse. Um, other issues around um, casualization or regularization of, of the workforce 
in many parts of the export trade, the workforce, I mean, for example, um, Mareka, who's just speaking from the Dominican Republic, the vast majority of workers on plantations in the Dominican Republic are from neighboring Haiti, Haiti and um, yeah, implicit with, with, with uh, you know, unregularized uh, migrant workers is that they're a lot more vulnerable to um, kind of uh, anti-union discrimination and so on. Um, and it's also worth just mentioning that the pandemic has, uh, 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 has had some impact as well. But just to give you a few examples of the types of um, uh, sort of anti-union activities or, or discrimination that um, workers can um, experience. I mean, it, 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 it can, can range from sort of, I mean, literally kind of, you know, verbal abuse, intimidation on the plantation itself, I think probably it's probably fairly well known that um, you know assassination uh, or, 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 or physical uh, violence against union officials is quite common in some parts of of Latin America. Uh, in some countries, um, labour legislation actually makes it uh, the bureauc bureaucratic requirements to set up a union make it um, very difficult to do so. Um, a common practice we come across um, on a number of, uh, in a number of countries, a number of scenarios is in many countries, there's a legal threshold of the proportion of the workforce. If the proportion of the workforce reaches a certain percentage, then an employer is obliged to recognize the union. Um, and it's not uncommon that as, a, a, as unions recruit members are near that threshold, that um, companies will start to sack union members on spurious, um, spurious grounds. Um, and that's just a sort of a small sample of the sorts of things that uh, you can expect. I, I mean, certainly in some parts of the banana producing world, I mean, the way I describe industrial relations or social dialogue in some parts of the world is that it, it, it is almost pathological, that there's, there are some um, employers that have a pathological hatred of unions and will go to any lengths to um, prevent them organising on their plantations. Um, Moving on to gender rights, um, I mean, women generally um, comprise a fairly small proportion of the um, workforce and are subject to discrimination in, in, in various different ways. I mean, there is, um, as there is in, in, in many industries around the world, I mean, there is a gender pay gap um, and partly that comes about because of the notion of traditional roles that the women are, are, are given on plantations, which are the less physically demanding and the less physically risky um, tasks, which then obviously attract less pay. Um, there are issues with women having access to training and access to kind of career development promotion and so on. Um, sexual harassment and gender violence is, is, is um, uh, it can be fairly prevalent in some parts of the, the, the banana producing world. And as well as um, women being particularly vulnerable to risks, uh, occupational health and safety risks, I mean, predominantly agrochemicals, but there are other issues around the way, for example, that pack houses are designed. Um, I mean, I, I've seen particularly on a fair trade plantation in Ghana where they um, opened a new organic um, pack house, which was specifically di designed ergonomically um, to be better suited to uh, uh, women workers' phys physiques than, uh, than, than is traditional. Um, I'll then just move on to living income, living wages. I mean, on the basis that, you know, a living income or a living wage is is, is a, a a human right. Um, as Mareka has, has, has set out in her, her her presentation, the biggest issue, in a sense, or the biggest driver of human rights abuses in in, in the export banana trade is the downward pressure on prices um, and subsequent downward pressure on wages. You can see from the diagram that I've put up on the slide there that um, workers are receiving on average only around about 5% of the value of every banana sold, whereas the retailers are getting over 40, 45, 40, sorry, nearly 45%. Um, and I think other things to, 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 to that um, there's an increasing kind of casualization, flexibilization of workforce um, piece rate work, temporary work, subcontracting work, which obviously affects or, you know, again, 
is um, uh, from an employer point of view is money saving and, 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 and less, less money ending up with the workers. Um, there are also, I mean, in, certainly in some of the banana producing countries, there are national minimum wages and, and, and in some of those workers are receiving those national minimum wages, but those national minimum wages aren't actually um, a level of, of income that would constitute a, a living wage to, to that country. Um, and I think it's also fair to say that uh, I was saying about unionization and the fact that the barriers to, 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 to union organization um, and the ability of workers to be able to negotiate uh, better pay, for example, is, 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 is uh, a, a problem. Um, and finally, just sort of working conditions and occupational health, which kind of ties in together. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, um, I mean, even in, 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 in the plantations with the best working conditions um, that you could find, you're still talking about people working in extreme tropical heat. Um, in many cases, they're working long hours, that, 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 that there's increasing use of overtime and what have you, um, poor facilities, lack of drinking water, particularly for workers. I mean, there's essentially two elements to working on a plantation. One is the pack house where the bananas come in from the field to be cleaned, washed, um, labelled and, and boxed up for, for, for um, export. But out in the, the actual fields where workers are, are, are either chopping down the bananas or they're controlling um, uh, diseases and things on the plantations, um, you know, it's not uncommon that there's a, you know, a lack of access to drinking water, toilet facilities, things like that. Um, and the other thing that's worth kind of um, being aware of is that, I mean, even in countries which have fairly reasonable or even the ones that have signed up to relevant um, ILO conventions on health and safety in agriculture, um, the actual enforcement, the labour and, you know, the resources that go into the inspection and enforcement of health and safety legislation in countries is usually found or is often found to be quite inadequate. So that is just a very quick kind of whistle-stop tour of the main issues. Um, and I think I will kind of leave it at that um, for, for the next speaker. But um, I think I'll, I, I would just echo what, um, what, what Mareka has said about um, addressing price is probably the, 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 the biggest issue in terms of being able to uh, address these um, human rights abuses. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, also for your interesting uh, contribution and thank you both uh, Marike again um, for for you know for setting the tone right and for also stressing the issue of price when it comes to human rights risks um, and then Paul I think the overview you made also of the human rights risks that are related to banana production actually are very um, is very interesting and very relevant because I think um, we don't really have an idea of the vast uh, types of human rights risks that, um, that that are considered actually when talking about banana production. So thank you all very much. Um, and let's see now how we can actually um, think about solutions or trying to you know, work on these different issues through the next presentations. So next up is, uh, is my colleague, Stan Sander Kuder from uh, Fairtrade Belgium, who's in charge of supply chain and impact. Um, and Stan will explain what Fairtrade is trying to do about some of these uh, human costs and these human rights risks um, that were addressed by both uh, Marike and Paul. Um, just uh, on a practical note, I see a lot of people are using the chat also to ask questions. May I ask you to please use the Q&A function because we, it's difficult to monitor both. So um, Stan, we are all ears for your presentation. Thank you. I was uh, planning to say good morning, but actually it's exactly noon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody here from, uh, I'm Stan Kunen uh, from Fairtrade Belgium. And my presentation is on how Fairtrade reduces, Fairtrade certification can reduce the human rights risk in the, in the banana supply chain. So before starting, um, it's important to set the scene. Um, um, when we look at some numbers, uh, on the left you see a diagram showing the, the globally exported volume, banana volume uh, in the world, and it's about 21 million ton. And we can see that almost 80% uh, is coming from, from Central and, and South America. And if you add up the Philippines, you arrive at 90% of the globally exported or traded bananas. But when we compare that to, to fair trade, um, 
so fair trade in 2020, uh, there was about 750,000 ton fair trade uh, certified bananas that was exported, mainly from four countries, uh, Dominican Republic, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. And more than 60% uh, was organic, and more than 50% um, was coming from, from smallholders that are organized in cooperatives. But in this webinar, uh, since the, the, the webinar is on, on, on human uh, right issues uh, related to low-cost bananas, so we want to focus not on the situation of the smallholders, but rather on the workers, workers that work in plantations, uh, and workers that also work for, for cooperatives. So that's, that's, that's setting the scene. Um, if you look at how fair trade concretely um, reduces the human rights risks, it all starts with, with uh, our Bible, um, the fair trade standards. And for the, the, the workers, we have a, a tailor-made hired labor standard, um, which contains, I think, it's more than 80 pages of, of, of criteria. And they are very concrete. And the, the, the fact that they are very concrete means also that they are easy to, to control, that uh, it's, 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 it facilitates the controlling that is done by, 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 by the auditors. So just to give some examples, so in addition on, on the essential, uh, essential criteria of, for example, forced labor, uh, we have specific um, um, criteria, extended list of criteria on social protection. Um, just to name some, there is a criteria in our standard on overtime. This should not reg on a regular base, basis, for example, exceed 40, 48 hours a week. It should be compensated overtime. Maternity leave should be at least eight weeks and should also be paid, etc. And all of these uh, rules should also be written, uh, should also be included in the written contract. So not only for permanent workers, also for temporary workers, there should be a written binding, binding contract. And yeah, I showed you that, uh, that um, in fair trade certified bananas, the, one of the main countries of origin is Dominican Republic. We know that more than 70% of workers in Dominican Republic have Haitian roots and, are, uh, and can be for, for a big part not uh, registered um, in, in, in Dominican Republic. But one of the, the essentials of, of our standards is non-discrimination. So we also request that uh, these workers benefit from the same social protection as the, 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 the other workers, but they should be registered in, in, in the farm or in, in the cooperative. Health protection, very important. Um, so we know that there is quite some agrochemicals used in banana uh, production. Fair trade restrict the chemical use to um, a list of, of uh, allowed uh, agrochemicals and also to where chemicals can be used. So there, is, so there should be some buffer zones, for example, and of course they shouldn't be used in, in um, uh, zones where people are living. And in addition, in addition, there are some strict precautionary measures uh, on, 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 on spraying, um, on protective equipment. So there should be a health and safety officer, for example. Um, the, the people that do spray, they should be examined, examined uh, once per year at least. Um, access to healthcare when there is an injury related to work, uh, there should be or a medical person in the bigger plantations, or there should be free transportation to, to, the, to the closest hospital. And very, very important, uh, we've heard it also from uh, in, in the presentations from Marika and Paul, um, the, the rights of, of freedom of association, collective bargaining, trade unions are, are key in fair trade. Uh, so not only um, um, everybody, all plantations should respect the rights, these rights, but also they should, be, they should sign a protocol um, on, on, on the rights of freedom of association, and they should communicate to all workers that they have the right of, of freedom of association or of collective bargaining or of trade unions. That's really important in our standards. Um, living wage, um, living income is human rights. And um, that's why also we, um, we, as of last year, we, uh, we included a living wage in our standard, in our banana standard. Um, to start now at this stage, all workers should earn at least 70% of living wage. Um, and the fair trade premium can be used up to 50% to, to cover the gap with living wage. If there is still a gap, there should be at least an annual wage increase and an agreement between farm owner and workers on uh, how and when to reach, reach when how and when to reach a living uh, wage. Um, and there are some good examples already in, in other countries, and we welcome very much partners that sell uh, bananas, fair trade bananas 
to already collaborate now on the living wage project to, to cover the differential because we think that uh, the sooner um, uh, the better actually to, to, uh, for, for all workers to, to earn a living wage. Fortunately, in some countries as in uh, Ecuador, um, it's already in the load that all workers should, should earn a, a living wage. Mm -hmm. So the fair trade premium. Um, so the premium, if we speak about cooperative, the premium is fully owned by the cooperative and is invested in machinery, equipment, etc. But if you speak about the workers, workers that work for in, in banana plantations, they uh, receive the premium and they fully own the premium. The premium for bananas is one dollar per box of bananas, per box of 18 kilo. So that means that there is a fair trade premium committee consisting of, of elected workers. And, um, and that fair trade premium committee uh, receives the, 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 the premium and fully can decide, uh, fully uh, independently um, uh, can decide on how um, uh, to use the premium, but it should go 100% uh, to the benefit of, of workers or the community of workers. In 2020, we saw that uh, the, the, it's almost 40 million euro, I think, fair trade premium that was um, paid to, to, to cooperatives and plantations. And when you look at plantations, uh, almost one quarter of the fair trade premium was used to renovate or buy uh, housing for the workers. Also very important, uh, the, the premium is used all over in um, education and scholarships in order to, to let the children of the workers continue uh, their studying. Also in healthcare, loans, uh, and also part of the premium is invested in, in the community, community infrastructure. Uh, for example, shops, uh, the, the workers that own shops to, to sell um, basic food products. Um, Marike already spoke about the fair trade minimum price that, is, uh, re that was revised um, um, the end of last year. And uh, so there is new fair trade minimum prices for bananas as of the 1st of January 2022. Um, and this revision is done in, on an annual basis. And that's needed because we know that uh, the, the cost for freight fertilizers, packaging costs, um, they increased uh, tremendously last year. And fortunately, the, the fair trade minimum price protects um, the, the plantations or the cooperatives uh, for all these increases and at least um, make sure that they, 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 they can produce in, econo in an economic sustainable way. Uh, that being said, um, uh, is that okay? The, the 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 price increase now, uh, as of first of January, was based on on the the, the the collection of data last year in August September. So it's a bit outdated already because costs continue to to increase. Um, Marika also spoke about it. There is this imbalance in trading power power in the banana supply chain, and this creates pressure on on producers. Paul also spoke about it, and there is a high risk on human rights violations. Um, also already mentioned by Marike, we were very uh, happy that the, the seven ministers of agriculture came together uh, of, the, of the main banana exporting countries and uh, they, they stressed the challenges of, for banana producers to survive in this context. Um, and they also mentioned and referred to fair trade as a certification that recognized the shared responsibility of covering the cost of, of the increased cost of production, but also the sustainability efforts we always uh, request more and more sustainability efforts, and that's logic. But yeah, who pays the price? And, and for the moment, it's, it's not uh, in balance. Um, so in summary, we can say that, um, and we can, I mean, we should be modest, but you can be really proud also uh, as a fair trade system that we, we strongly uh, reduce the human and environmental risk in the supply chain by our standards, but also by our boots on the ground. Uh, we have this, uh, but a sustainable banana program that focuses, for example, on soil health, on water um, consumption, etc. The premium is invested in workers' facilities and in social means, and the minimum price covering the cost of sustainable production. So, looking at plantations again, fair trade is a is a win-win for the farm owners because they they receive the fair trade minimum price, and for the workers because of the social protection, the premium, and then the voice they have in, in the in the organization in the company. And that leads, as was illustrated also by a study in 2019, to lower employment in fair trade certified plantations and to lower risks on, um, on, on human rights violations. Um, but we should also be modest and say that broader initiatives are needed to resolve the, the sector wide human rights uh, risks. First of all, as I mentioned in, in the first slide, fair share globally 
so the fair trade uh, share is only below 5%, it's between 3 and 4%. Fortunately, in Belgium, we can say that uh, one out of five bananas is fair trade. And also, yeah, banana producers are a bit victim of the popularity of bananas also here in Europe. It's one of the best selling SKUs in the retailer. And um, yeah, there is a big part of bananas that are sold without or, or with negative margin even. Uh, because of this um, competition, bananas are used as, as, a, as a competition tool. Rekening houden met de concurrentie. De bananen worden gebruikt door de retailers als marketing tool om aan te geven dat ze de... So locally produced apples, which is a bit absurd, to be honest. So there is a kind of race to the bottom uh, competition game on, on bananas. And that's why we think there is a legal framework needed and the sector-wide initiative also can strongly contribute to, to, to resolve these uh, sector-wide uh, issues on, on bananas. And that's a bridge to uh, the next presenter. But um, Kun, you will make the bridge, I guess. No, but th thank you so much, Stan, for already um, you know, doing part of my job. But indeed, yeah, that's a bridge to the next uh, presentation. I think what you presented was actually very complementary to the interventions by Paul and Marike. Um, highlighting what fair trade tries to do about these um, that is human class but as you rightfully put it then it's uh, we need to we need certification and beyond we need to look uh, beyond certification as well and that's why i'm very happy to introduce Charles Charles Snook who's our next speaker um, who works for IDH as a senior uh, program manager and who manages the Belgian um, initiative for sustainable cocoa beyond chocolate. And so Shara will hide, highlight some of the lessons learned by IDH on beyond chocolate and other multi-stakeholder initiatives um, to give us some ideas and inspiration on what could be done um, in Belgium. So please, uh, Shara, without further ado, please go ahead. Many thanks, Kuhn, and, and thanks also, Stan, for the indeed uh, excellent bridge. Uh, I do also firmly believe uh, that if we want to uh, if, if we want to respond to the challenges that we're facing as a as a society today, right, as a human society, we will need to look at, at what every stakeholder can do. Uh, and so this means that we look uh, at indeed complementarity between uh, the need to review policies and regulation, uh, but also um, work on partnerships uh, to really be able to, uh, to create impact at scale. Uh, you've seen the volumes, you know the number of farmers um, talking about in bananas, but also in other supply chains. Uh, and so I think that, that we, uh, we need to also see the size of the challenge and, and therefore the size of the impact that we want to, to generate. Uh, so I'll be speaking today, uh, indeed, in about 10 minutes, uh, try to give a, a quick overview uh, of, uh, of what is happening in, in that sphere of multi-stakeholder initiatives and specifically also in uh, initiatives that have living wages uh, and living incomes uh, as an ambition. Uh, as Marike and Paul also, um, also shared, uh, I think it is very timely that we, uh, that we, we not start, but that we have these discussions and, and try to uh, to also together uh, together uh, define next steps. So my name is Charles. I work for uh, IDH, the Sustainable uh, Trade Initiative, as program manager for uh, the Belgian uh, the Belgian program uh, for sustainable cocoa beyond chocolate. Uh, today I will not talk that much about chocolate, but more about uh, the approach. Uh, that we uh, use to catalyze private sector uh, solutions. So maybe very quickly, um, uh, for those who don't know, uh, who don't know IDH, uh, we structure our approach uh, and our programs around three uh, three big pillars, uh, which uh, will echo a little bit with uh, also what has been said by previous presenters. Uh, so internally, we speak about the three Bs, but we really have a focus on better incomes, uh, better job, uh, better jobs, and better environments. So I think that this is a way for us to simply make sure that, that we touch on the three pillars when we are uh, working with partners or, or developing new programs. Uh, one transversal uh, penalty that is not on this slide uh, is uh, gender. Uh, we could put it as a fourth bullet. Uh, I haven't on this slide today because I like to keep them simple, uh, but also because it's a transversal team. Uh, and so it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be the right place, in my opinion, to just add a fourth uh, bullet here. So. Um, 
Today, uh, IDH uh, has been has been growing as an organization, and so uh, very quickly as well, you'll see that today we, we have more than 240 staff uh, that is uh, uh, located around the world uh, in Brussels, uh, Belgium. Uh, we have a staff now uh, of, uh, of five people um, that are working on Beyond Chocolate, uh, but also working with partners on, uh, on other uh, programs, as you will see in the next couple of slides. Um, what is um, a red line, I would say, or, um, or what is uh, the, the common base of, uh, of what we do is really working on market transformation. So you see that we work uh, specifically on 12 commodities. Uh, but also uh, on landscape approaches. And so this makes really the link between the social aspects and the environmental aspects. I'm sorry for the noise, that's my dog being really thirsty at the moment. Um, so as, as we've seen in previous presentations, and I will not go too much into, uh, into the details, but I firmly believe that uh, the biggest challenge that we are facing today as a society is the context of poverty or the context of extreme poverty. We've seen also reports uh, lately on, on the rising inequalities. And, and so this creates really an unfavorable context when we're talking about human rights and environment. Um, it is uh, also for good reason that the SDG number one is ending poverty. Uh, I will always remember one phrase that was shared to me by a cocoa producer uh, saying that a hungry stomach does not have any ears. Uh, and that indeed, uh, in the context of poverty or extreme poverty, uh, the question of sustainability is not very high up on the agenda, and it creates a situation uh, where people uh, indeed are, are in a context where they have a tendency to accept uh, also conditions uh, that are uh, human rights infractions uh, or that are simply not, 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 uh, not good for them. And so I think that, that this is really the big challenge that we need to address today. Uh, but again, um, there is the size uh, and the complexity of this challenge. And, and so we hear often when talking about this, uh, that there is no simple solution, there is no silver bullet, and that no one can do this alone. And, and this is also something that I would agree with, uh, with this nice sentence from uh, Mr. Halford Lukock saying that no one can whistle a symphony, uh, it takes a whole orchestra to play. Uh, and so that is precisely what we are trying to do in our approaches, uh, is to bring uh, the different stakeholders together around joint ambitions. And when I say different stakeholders, we're talking, of course, about the private sector, we're talking about the retail, but we're also talking about uh, certifiers, we're talking about public sector, uh, about academics, knowledge institutions, uh, and of course, civil society organizations, both in consuming and in producing countries. Uh, I think if we want to really create this impact at scale, we will have to find a way to make sure that our individual, that the sum of our individual contribution uh, creates a bigger impact uh, than what we would be doing alone. So um, briefly on how we work and a couple of principles that, that are important when, uh, when engaging in this type of work uh, is really uh, one, the ambition to deliver large scale impact. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we have everyone or most uh, around the table. Uh, we know there's many different approaches, many different uh, organizations, um, but if we want to really speak of transformation, uh, we will need to have the wider group around the table, not only, uh, not only the more ambitious players, uh, they are the ones that we definitely need because we need to have concrete examples, but I would argue that we want to have a large group to really be able to speak about uh, sector transformation. What we went, then do in these settings is work around three, uh, three basic concepts, that is uh, engaging inspiring and empowering. Uh, when it comes to engaging, uh, and, and I can here share briefly the experience of Beyond Chocolate, it is important that we engage around a really strong uh, and clearly defined commitment. Uh, that is when we can convene public and private sectors, uh, start building trust, alignment, uh, and uh, a common understanding of both the actual situation and what is then needed to create change. 
Secondly, we would inspire, uh, and I mean not we inspire the people around the table, but create a context where indeed stakeholders can also inspire each other uh, with uh, successes and failures, uh, with new strategies and innovations. And lastly, I would say empower. Uh, this is a concept, of course, that is very, very relevant uh, to, uh, to an organization such as Fair Trade. Uh, here, my point would be that empowerment should be pulled through the whole supply chain. We know, uh, I also believe that most people on this planet want to do good. Um, and so it is important that we also understand what they need uh, to take extra action. So I would here argue that uh, the other stakeholders around the table uh, at certain level also need to be empowered to be, able, to be able to take additional action towards our joint objectives. A couple of a couple of examples uh, of sector platforms. I will of course not go through this whole list, um, but I'm sure the slides will be shared afterwards, and, and, and uh, the audience will be able to look up the ones that are of interest to them. Uh, maybe a few highlights. I've briefly touched upon Beyond Chocolate, and we'll do so in the next slide. Uh, but that, that is an example of a Belgian multi-stakeholder initiative that was launched uh, in December 2018. Uh, with the ambition, uh, amongst other things, to realize leaving incomes for cocoa producers supplying the Belgian market by, 2020, by 2030. Sorry. Um, I will mention here also uh, the, the, three, uh, the three following ones, so the Floriculture Sustainability Initiative, uh, CIFAF, the Sustainability Initiative for Fruit and Vegetables, and Sustainable Juice Covenant, because I think these three in particular uh, are very relevant and interesting for this discussion, uh, since they also integrate a living wage commitment and ambition. So, for example, partners in CIFAF, uh, in, in the, new, uh, the newly launched program, uh, also have a clear engagement uh, to uh, start measuring living wage gaps and defining pathways uh, for uh, one commodity uh, to start with. Uh, and so these are examples I think we can start digging into uh, to see uh, what exactly is possible through these uh, sector platforms. A couple of quick learnings uh, from Beyond Chocolate. I will not go too much into detail here, but as I've said before, the ambition is really to create a setting where we can ensure that sharing responsibility and, uh, and stimulating collaborative action will increase the impact of our joint effort. Uh, again, we know it is complex. Uh, we know we will need every stakeholder to take an additional step. Um, what is important to make this work, I believe, is that we have a clear, uh, inclusive and representative governance structure. So every stakeholder, again, needs to be empowered in these partnerships to take, an, uh, to take uh, up their role and responsibility. Uh, we're also working on additionality. So uh, to be very concrete on Beyond Chocolate, what we will not do is create a new label or a new claim that can be used on back of uh, the partners of Beyond Chocolate. This is what we don't do. Uh, what we want to do is create, again, this environment where we can start building up on what already exists. And so this comes back to uh, the comment that was made previously, I think, by Kuhn. Um, I think it is really important that we have, uh, for example, certifiers and, and uh, sustainability programs being recognized in Beyond Chocolate, uh, being part of our intermediary targets, but also a recognition together that we need to, to build further upon that and that extra steps are needed to generate the impact that we envision. Um, last two points, of course, transparency. I think these partnerships work uh, when we develop tools that allow partners to hold each other accountable and when we're able to measure uh, and show progress uh, and create a trustful environment that triggers action. Uh, I think this is also one of the keys. Uh, one example in Beyond Chocolate is a funding that has been created to co-finance pilot projects uh, with living income ambitions. This allows to innovate, to create examples, and to push partners to take that extra step. Uh, I wanted to quickly uh, take a, 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 a quick, quick dive into the roadmap on living wages uh, that was uh, launched with a, a number, a wide number of partners uh, in 2019. Uh, I know Fairtrade is also part of that uh, of that steering committee. Um, but with the roadmap on living wages, um, what we really aimed to do uh, is, again, uh, create a setting, a multi-stakeholder setting uh, that empowers partners in supply chains 
uh, to uh, make a move towards living wages. Uh, so uh, again, I will not read all the details, but the roadmap is structured uh, around five, uh, five simple steps. Uh, so the steps are simple, but the work behind it, of course, uh, can be heavy and, and complex. But the first step would be to really uh, identify the living wage, uh, identify the benchmark for the region uh, where the product uh, is sourced. Uh, there are a lot of benchmarks that are available today, still a few gaps, but we see that uh, in the living wage sphere, these benchmarks are, uh, are coming up uh, more and more. Uh, second point would be to measure uh, and to understand uh, the workers' current earnings uh, and understand the gap. Uh, third step, uh, would be to verify and to ensure that there's, uh, that there's uniformity in how these gaps uh, are measured and verified. Uh, step four and five are the action steps. So closing the living wage gaps and defining pathways and, and means to, uh, to realize the ambition and then make sure we can also capture learnings that can then be uh, shared back with, uh, with the wider group. So uh, I invite you all to uh, take a look at the website as well. Um, because there is really a support package also for uh, companies and stakeholders that want to uh, join in this movement. Uh, and one of these tools um, that has been uh, increasingly used by partners in the last uh, in the last two years is the salary matrix. Um, and so that is one, uh, one example of how, uh, how partners are then supported to really uh, start measuring the gap and, and seeing exactly what interventions are needed to uh, move towards uh, living wages. So the salary matrix, uh, again, allows to, uh, to really capture uh, the wages, bonuses, and in-kind benefits uh, to, uh, to sometimes monetize uh, benefits uh, that uh, exist uh, in plantations to compare with living wage and then to, uh, to start making a plan. Uh, since 2021, this salary, this salary matrix uh, is also uh, adopted uh, by Fairtrade uh, and Rainforest to, uh, to feed into their strategies uh, for living wages. So today, um, more than 500 uh, salary matrices have been uh, completed uh, in different uh, supply chains. Bananas, uh, of course, uh, are uh, one of the, let's say, the hits uh, when it comes to the salary matrix. Uh, it is one of the sectors uh, where we can see indeed that the discussion probably is higher upon the agenda than, let's say, with, uh, with avocado and pineapples. Although we all know here that this discussion would be equally relevant to uh, to these supply chains, uh, but this just to show uh, that um, that the discussion is ongoing and that action is also uh, being triggered in the living wage sphere. And so I hope that today also um, will allow us um, uh, to seize the opportunity and to see whether uh, such processes uh, could be kickstarted uh, in Belgium and or other countries uh, in the next. Uh, in the next month uh, or months. Uh, as we know, the SDG agenda is 2030. Uh, and so I think there's uh, little time to lose if we want to really, uh, again, as a society, move towards realizing these ambitions. Uh, to end this presentation with, uh, and to give you a few, uh, a few names, I'm saying there is movement in the living wage sphere, but this, uh, of course, uh, should be supported uh, by names of organizations. And so just quickly flying over uh, the National Dutch Retailers Commitment on Living Wages. Uh, and so there has been also a specific uh, commitment from Dutch uh, retailers facilitated by IDH uh, on living wages uh, for bananas specifically. Uh, and so here the ambition is that uh, for the engaged retailers, 75% of their uh, volumes of bananas uh, should be living wage bananas by 2025. Uh, what we see is that uh, the work with the living wage roadmap and the salary matrix is also gaining traction in the UK. So with a number of, uh, of retailers here that have started to use the salary matrix just to get a better idea of what uh, exactly the living wage gap is in their supply chains and what, uh, what measures they could take to, uh, to move forward. Uh, Germany also uh, is jumping on board of this work, uh, supported by, uh, by GIZ, uh, so by the public uh, sector as well, uh, with German retailers to also 
uh, apply this work uh, on uh, their supply chains. Um, I hope I was able to give a quick overview in, in about 10 minutes, uh, but very happy to uh, join in the discussion today. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Charlotte, for your very complete uh, presentation. Um, and so without going deeper into your presentation right now, because time is, uh, is running out, um, let's move to the panel discussion. Um, so we have some experts here today um, whom we invited to comment um, on the different presentations that were made from their own um, perspective. Um, and so we, the, the, the experts that we invited um, are, uh, include, include uh, Frank Vermeers, who is a customer relations and marketing at Agrofair. Uh, Agrofair is an important, important importer of sustainable and fair trade and organic fresh fruit, including uh, bananas. Then we also invited Karen, Karen Janssens, who's in charge of sustainable sourcing at Colored Group, which is, of course, one of the leading Belgian retailers. Uh, then we're very happy also to have Nathalie De Geve, who is Director of Sustainability at Comias, uh, which unites and represents Belgian trade and services. And then we're very happy also that uh, Dr. Boris Verbrugge could join us, who is a senior researcher at Hiva Kaiulun and conducts research on decent work and human rights in global value chains. Now, um, Perhaps, Frank, we could start uh, with you, perhaps in, 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 because we don't have that much time, no, unfortunately. No, no, I understand. I will keep it short. This is something that you asked me, so I will respect that. Thank you so much. <laughs> so please, could you elaborate a bit on how you see these issues evolving, and yes. in particular, to, to hear your view on, on the issue of price, yeah. so both from a consumer and producer point of view. Of course. Um, and of course, as Agrofair, you're very close to producers as well, so mm -hmm. could, could you elaborate a bit on that? Thank yeah. you. Well, I will talk uh, from my own experience, which is that um, I started about 16 years ago in this, for me at that time, quite exotic world of fair trade, because I was not aware of the, what was happening with the, within this world. So um, when I started for, before I, I worked for Agrofair, I started to work for Fair Trade Belgium. And... Um, they simply asked me, Frank, you have a background as a, a salesman and a marketeer. Go and fight the market. Um, talk to the retailers, uh, uh, visit the shops, do store shakes, everything. So at that time, I've, I, not, I, I didn't have only um, bananas. It was a whole range of products, but nevertheless, uh, fair trade bananas became the most important product for me. And uh, so I went to the shops and what I saw was quite astonishing. I mean, most of the time when I entered into these shops, you could hardly find fair trade bananas because they were covered by mountains of well-branded bananas. On the other side and on top of it, most of the time um, they were very high priced and the quality was bad because, all, because of all these circumstances. So, and there was no competition at all. A few years later, fair trade bananas became a little bit more accepted. Uh, they got out of the niche and then there was competition. And I mean, healthy competition because there's nothing against healthy competition. Competition is even needed. So it went on and uh, everybody was talking about fair trade uh, and everybody, even the producers were quite, quite happy. That doesn't mean that everything was perfect, but it was okay. Now we are in a situation whereby we have unhealthy competition. What I mean is that we are getting in the, in the meal stream of the normal business. There's too much competition and there are victims all over the ocean. So in fact, what we do now, and I'm not only talking about fair trade bananas, is we sponsor poverty. If you sell a banana at minus one euro, that is absolutely not accept acceptable anymore. And it sounds maybe a little bit funny that I'm talking as, as a salesman, as a, as a marketeer for 
a, um, a commercial company to talk like this, but this is reality. We are confronted every day with these facts. And simply, this is absolutely not acceptable anymore. And to finalize, and maybe that is important too, I hope that we are not talking in echo chambers because if we need to persuade or to convince those who are already convinced, that, that would not be very fruitful. So I think that there should be like uh, one of the other speakers said, there should be some kind of, we should create some kind of platform to talk with each other. It doesn't help us to accuse anybody, but we need to find a solution. I'd like to end with that. Thank you. For, that's, uh, um, that's ending on a positive note. I think that's uh, the way we should consider things that are happening and, and, and really look forward to, um, you know, to what, what can be done. Um, and this brings us actually also to the next um, next intervention. So, um, so Karen, perhaps you could complete like with your uh, point of view from a retailer's perspective. What do you think would need to happen um, to fight these human rights uh, violations in, in the banana value chain? And in terms of like instruments and incentives, what what would be needed uh, from a retailer's perspective to be, to make the banana value chain um, sustainable? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kun. Um, I think actually um, action at three levels is needed. On the one hand, I think um, we're talking about bananas, about selling bananas. So you need a willing consumer who is willing to buy sustainable bananas or bananas uh, that respect human rights. Um, and I was happy to hear very positive numbers, Kun, that you mentioned in your introduction. Um, but I think we all know that there is this gap between what a consumer thinks or what a citizen thinks. Uh, and I really believe uh, citizens think or feel as such, but then when they make the purchasing decision in the shop, um, we see another image. Eh? As a retailer, we can also testify that um, the fair trade organic banana is not, uh, doesn't have the biggest uh, share of, of, of our bananas. So that's one thing. Um, a second thing you need is, I think, a willing government. The government can set a scene, can create an enabling environment. Um, they can do so uh, via legislation, like the human rights due diligence legislation, which is coming up, which can uh, for sure create this um, level playing field. But they can also do this by um, being a neutral convener in multi-stakeholder initiatives, I think uh, Frank was referring to and uh, Charles has testified about, um, it can be very useful to bring all actors together and to set common ambitions to, to raise the bar together because uh, there is not one actor who can, who can solve this issue alone. Um, and then third, you need, of course, um, also a willing private sector. And I will elaborate a little bit on that, um, given I'm representing Colred Group here. So I think basically we have three strategies to ensure human rights in our value chains. One is we use uh, Amphori BSCI code of conduct. Um, all our suppliers um, sign a letter of commitment and we use this also to engage the conversation. Um, the second mean, the second way is um, certification, and the third uh, way is um, going into a deeper relation with all the actors along the value chain and develop what we call international value chain projects. Um, the last two strategies are super important. For bananas, for instance, we only have certified bananas on shelf, either Fair Trade or uh, Rainforest Alliance. However, I think um, there is still room for improvement and we've seen it in, 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 in the discussions. Um, I agree that also there, there is a race to the bottom, which in the end doesn't serve uh, anybody. But I also think I would also like to challenge the certifiers here and then maybe more in particular fair trade. Um, for a consumer, I think it's important, at least for me as a consumer, if I buy the organic fair trade banana, I would like to be sure that the, the worker on the plantation has had the living wage. Today, it's not the case. For a retailer, we have tens of thousands of products on shelf. So if a certification could ensure this living wage, I think this would be a huge step forward. Um, of course, uh, certifiers cannot solve this problem alone. So I think we also need to go further. And that's this third strategy uh, to um, 
engage our suppliers more in, um, in a real conversation and to bring sustainability uh, within the purchasing discussions. Uh, we, for Bananas, we started to doing this last year. We talked with our suppliers on issues such as um, living wages. And I think um, this, is a, this is necessary. And this is, this is something we can do and we should do. And um, that this can be the beginning of, of, of a way forward from, uh, from our point of view. Yeah. Right. So I think that the, yeah, I, I think certification, engaging with suppliers, going for the really shared and differentiated responsibility, and I think uh, government certifiers and also consumers can um, also have each their role to play in in the thing. Okay, thank you very much, Karen, and also for highlighting the role of consumers. I think that wasn't uh, already discussed that much, besides you know the short intro I gave on that point. Um, I also like the, the challenge that you suggested for fair trade. I think perhaps after um, all the panelists have intervened, perhaps Marike and, um, and Stan could uh, briefly react on the challenge of living wage and, and fair trade. Um, now let's um, also hear from one of our other panelists, uh, perhaps Natalie, you with uh, Kamias, where you present Belgian trade and services and you also advocate for their interests. Um, and in that since you also have a good knowledge of what works um, and what, what doesn't work. Um, could you explain a bit on how you see this evolution and, and you know, regarding multi-stakeholder initiatives and etc. How do, what is your take on that with companies? Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, Natalie, I think you're experiencing some connection issues. Perhaps you could restart. I think it's better now. Yes, you can do, I hope you can hear me. Thank you. Yes, yes. now we can hear you. Okay. So um, first of all, as, as the retail sector, we uh, prefer voluntary commitments to binding legislation. And why? It's because it allows different retailers to work towards the same goal, but each in their own way. And in that way, it makes differentiation between retailers, retailers possible. Um, voluntary commitments or by individual companies. And one example of, of such a sector commitment is the partnership Beyond Chocolates already mentioned before. And the result of that is that 100% of the private label, label chocolate of five food retailers in Belgium um, are now certified sustainable since uh, 2020. And a success factor for that, for the Beyond Chocolate, is that the com commitment not only applies to private labels, uh, so the retailers' own brands, but also to the national brands. So partnership throughout the value chain is important. Um, what we ask as a federation is to be involved from the beginning in this kind of initiatives so that we can, uh, as a federation, play our facilitating role towards all retailers and so that they can all have the opportunity to step into the story from the start. And support from the federation also helps to communi communicate on behalf of a whole sector. And to conclude, my advice to ensure success is first of all create dialogue from the beginning and learn from each other uh, in a broad stakeholder participation through the value chain but also with certification bodies universities and governments then engage citizens and consumers in the commitment as already said by karen um, integrate new specifications in existing certification schemes as a way to upscale and improve step-by-step. Step. And last but not least, share best practices and report in a realistic way. That would be my message. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Natalie, um, for also highlighting this point of view from uh, from Comias, and I hear your preference for, for voluntary initiatives when it comes to sustainable um, value chains. Um, at the same time, it was already mentioned a couple of times before that there are also binding regulations coming up regarding uh, sustainable value change due diligence, but also uh, imported deforestation and all these kind of things. And, and therefore, it would be interesting to also have an insight on, on how 
these voluntary initiatives can be complementary to to binding regulation, which is which will happen one way or another um, in the in the near future. Um, and I'm, I'm therefore very happy actually to have Boris here with us. Um, so perhaps Boris, you, could you try and give some insights on how you could believe these um, sort of you know this voluntary approach and binding regulation approach could be complementary, uh, and and if so, what then would be the vol added value of a voluntary initiative? Thank you. Thank you, Kun, and uh, I will try indeed. Um, so it is indeed a timely question, given that the Commission will probably come out in the coming weeks with a proposal for uh, for binding due diligence regulation. Um, so my focus here will be when I talk about voluntary initiatives, it will be on multi-stakeholder initiatives, so not initiatives that are purely corporate driven. Um, and I'm focusing on due diligence legislation, so meaning legislation that essentially obliges companies to identify and address human rights and environmental risks in their uh, value chain. Um, so first of all, when we look at multi-stakeholder initiatives, so voluntary initiatives, it's important to underline that they're highly heterogeneous. They're highly heterogeneous in terms of their focus, in terms of the instruments that are being used, so codes of conduct, social audits, um, and so forth, in terms of their governance. Uh, but most importantly, there's uh, differences in the extent to which multi-stakeholder initiatives actually engage with due diligence processes. Um, I think on, on the positive side, multi-stakeholder initiatives can have uh, potential as incubators of innovative uh, and more inclusive approaches to, uh, to due diligence. They can be norm setting, so they can raise the standards in a sector. Um, at the same time, uh, we see that many, many multi-stakeholder initiatives that do engage with due diligence continue to face important challenges, uh, not least in terms of monitoring the actual situation on the ground. And related to this, uh, including the actual rights holders, so the workers, local communities, um, and smallholders. More broadly, I do think that there's quite a lot of research showing that um, that adherence uh, to, to and participation in MSIs and adherence to set standards remains voluntary and voluntarism alone does not do the trick. Uh, there are many companies that still fall well short of what they are uh, expected to do based on international norms and guidelines. So this is also what explains the, the persistent demand and the clear trend towards hard legislation. The legislation, uh, legislation raises the bar, it levels the playing field for companies that are taking sincere steps towards addressing, addressing sustainability challenges. And it also creates a new arena for holding companies to account. At the same time, legislation is not a magic bullet. Uh, there are clear risks involved. I will briefly highlight two of those risks. The first one is to foster a compliance culture. So essentially the, the box ticking exercise. Uh, which may create a disconnect between, on the one hand, the paper reality and realities on the ground. A second risk is that um, companies might uh, respond by simply avoiding purportedly unsustainable um, suppliers that are unable to meet the new and often very demanding standards. And I'm mainly talking about small, medium-sized enterprises and smallholders who risk becoming excluded from supply chains altogether. And then the last, uh, the last point, um, and that's of course the question that, that was laid before me, um, how can multi-stakeholder initiatives help address these risks that are inherent to legislation? Uh, I think first of all, they can help companies make sense of what they ought to do. They can help companies, but also civil society and government actors to actually understand how they should do it so they can provide operational guidance. Um, they can provide a platform for dialogue between different stakeholders. Of course, that's multi-stakeholder initiatives. And they can help companies realize economies of scale. For instance, where it comes to audits, working together is better than doing it alone. Um, and most importantly, they can help companies reflect about how they can move beyond compliance, beyond certification, beyond audits. And that's what it's all about. Um, so yes, I think um, that due diligence legislation, of course, this is something that is often said, it should be part of a smart mix that also includes measures to support uh, genuine multi-stakeholder collaboration that works towards effective, inclusive due diligence. And in that sense, uh, participation, corporate participation in multi-stakeholder initiatives that promote inclusive and effective due diligence should definitely be incentivized. And I think that's something very important for a government to uh, pay attention to. So uh, yeah, that would be my message for today. 
Thank you, uh, Boris. It's uh, very complete. Um, um, yeah, I think it's very complementary also to, to all of the things that were said here um, today. Now we still have uh, 10 minutes left. Um, I would also ask now the, the speakers, uh, so Charles Paul, um, Marika and Stein, if you perhaps have any thoughts or reactions to what was said by our uh, panelists. Um, is there somebody who would also who would already like to react? Marika, I see you nodding, so please take the floor. Yes, yes. I think I have, have some comments to the three. First of all, Karen, I think you mentioned that a fair trade should secure and or could and should secure living wages. I think fair trade definitely can secure living wages because we have the financial tools to do so. We have a fair trade minimum price that can and should cover living wages. But on the other hand, what we cannot secure, secure as fair trade is a 1% fair trade purchase. So there are two conditions for living wages. One is the price that should cover the cost. But the other also is that farmers should sell 100% of the bananas as fair trade to cover the cost in a sustainable way. And what we have seen is that with increasing costs and fair trade probably is one of the, um, the, the highest uh, costs or prices in the market, uh, farmers has, have seen a reduction in fair trade sales, which also uh, affects their potential to pay living wage. So I think both need to go together prices and volumes that enable farmers to pay a living wage. Uh, on the other hand, Natalie, you, you talked about voluntary. And uh, I, I think uh, voluntarily, uh, not necessarily work. Uh, there are many issues we need to do voluntarily, but voluntarily also enable retailers to choose and pick and to, to decide if one or another human or an environmental right is more important than the other. And we have seen it currently that there's very much a focus on living wage. There is no focus or very, very little focus on living income. And definitely it's not linked to the price retailers want to pay. So in some way we need binding regulations because there is a high consciousness about sustainability, uh, but retailers are opting for wanting more and paying less. So we need to create some coherences in, in it. And at the end, uh, with regards to Boris, about binding regulations. Concernant the regulations contraignantes. De dwingende regelgevingen betreft. Wel, dwingende regels, enkel en alleen, dat zou kunnen niet volstaan, maar die zijn wel noodzakelijk. De bedrijven. En invest in een in race to the bottom, because after decades of affecting sustainable issues, social as well as, as, well as environment, it cannot be fixed by regulation and it cannot be fixed from now to tomorrow. It needs investment. So the binding issue needs to be in sharing responsibility and investing in all those sustainabilities that has been affected due to purchasing practices that, that's with negative impact on human and environmental rights. Thank you, uh, Marika. Uh, perhaps I don't know, Stan, if you would like to complement something from, you know, from the fair trade family perspective. Yeah, I can only uh, add to what Marika said that living wage or living income is an inherent and a very essential part of our fair trade international strategy. But um, as Marika said, yeah, there is the volume aspect and I can just give you the example of uh, cocoa. So the, the, the past fair trade minimum price was $2,000 per ton. The living income um, um, minimum price or price would be $3,000 per ton. So we did increase uh, our fair trade minimum price for, for cocoa from 2000 to 2400 dollars per ton. And then we indeed we really traded volume of fair trade certified cocoa. So the good thing about fair trade is that 50% 
of the votes of decisions are um, done by, by the certified producers. They are represented in our General Assembly and our, uh, in our board internationally. And they are usually the, the party with, who, are, who is most reluctant to, um, to dramatically increase the fair trade minimum price, including the living wage or living income uh, uh, costs. So we will go there, but it needs to be done step by step. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Stan. I don't know, Charles and Paul, do you also want to react on some of the things that were said? Thanks. Um, yes, if I could just... ahead. Sorry. Sorry, yes, if I, I, I could make a, a, a few observations. Um, uh, um, I think we're all in, in agreement that, that um, what needs to be done is a, a reversal of the, the race to the bottom, um, and that there are obviously various ways of doing that. Um, and the initiatives around living wages, for example, are we see that certainly as a, a, a core element of, um, of of addressing that, and also building the capacity of unions and promoting social dialogue between unions and employers to, to address these issues. I mean, we ourselves are, are involved in various um, living wa wa wage initiatives using the IDH salary matrix through the World Banana Forum. We've been working with some of the retailers um, around their plans for initially kind of measuring li living wage gaps on, on plantations. There are other drivers, that, that, there's been reference to the human rights due diligence legislation. There's also the EU directive on, on fair trading practices, all of which are kind of driving um, things in the right kind of direction. The one point I just want to make a quick point about, because it was asked about in the chat, which was about competition law, um, because certainly we see that as, um, essentially there is an impact, I mean, you can say that the race to the bottom and the cutthroat competition by supermarkets is testament to the success of competition law. But what competition law fails to recognize is that in doing that, the suppliers are the ones who suffer. Um, the issue, it's not just in banana supply chains, I mean, other agricultural supply chains, the domestic dairy supply chain in the UK has the same problem that retailer buying power pushes prices down below sustainable levels. Um, and we see that partly as being a sort of a, a, a failure, a market failure and something that needs to be addressed through market intervention and different ways of doing that. Um, I mean, some countries, I think, including Belgium, actually do have a prohibition on selling below cost price. But for various reasons, um, those sorts of um, things in, in individual countries are fairly ineffective. In the UK, the recognition by competition authorities, I, I qualify this by saying I worked for many years for the UK's competition authority, so I, I kind of uh, have a bit of expertise in this subject, recognise that issue by setting up what was called a groceries code adjudicator, who would um, enable suppliers to lodge complaints about exploitation by supermarkets. The only problem with that is it doesn't extend outside of UK boundaries, but there are different ways of intervening in the market. But certainly we see that market intervention is an element of, um, or you know, changes competition law is an element of how we address this problem uh, uh, along with living wages. I'd like to also address, there was a question on certification, but uh, I, I won't hog the conversation, but oh, simply to say that uh, uh, the question that was asked by Quiver Buckley from Fives is one that we certainly recognise as being one of the uh, other issues to address, which is the prolific there's research I've seen recently to show UK consumers increasingly are using certification as a, a, a as, as a driver for making purchasing decisions. But I've also seen research that says that consumers don't actually understand the differences between or what all the different labels mean. And without going into great detail, there is a huge wide range. Uh, I think it was described as deep blue water between the fair trade certification system and Rainforest Alliance and what it delivers, for example. So there are huge you know, differences between what different um, ethical certification schemes mean as well. But um, yeah, that's just I just wanted to address those two points that I saw raised in the questions. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Paul, because, you know, we don't have that much time anymore. So it's good that you already answered some of the questions. Um, I think that some of other questions, um, specifically questions related to living wage and fair trade, were also quite elaborately already answered by um, Stan and, um, and Marika. But before diving a bit deeper into the questions, uh, Shao, you haven't have had an opportunity to react. So please, uh, the floor is yours. No, thanks, and I'll try to be very quick, but maybe one one point uh, that was raised raised by Marika as well uh, on, on the ability for uh, a single actor such as Fair Trade to really 
um, make the difference that we envision, uh, we need to look at volumes uh, and we need to look at scale uh, indeed. That's why I do believe, uh, as it was said, I, I believe by Frank also that we need to get everyone around the table because um, you will always have uh, somehow uh, a negative effect of having competition on, on sustainability ambitions. And so that is why I think that, that uh, if we want to really talk about sector change, we would benefit from bringing everyone around a joint commitment. I'm not saying that we all have the same, to have the same pathway, trajectory or tools to realize that commitment. But as long as sustainability uh, remains one item uh, where uh, companies can differentiate and have competition with each other, we'll risk to have negative impact. Uh, and so this, this brings back to the question of volumes and the impact at scale that we envision. And so that's why I believe uh, as a second point that there's really a need to combine both voluntary approaches and uh, look at uh, the policy environment and eventually uh, binding measures. I know in cocoa, for example, it's interesting to see that the cocoa sector since uh, I believe already end of 2019 has been calling on the EU uh, to develop uh, legislation on imported deforestation, on imported deforestation, to develop legislation on human rights due diligence. And so you can see that at some point when there is a sector commitment, there is also a positioning from the sector towards that is favorable towards a, an enabling policy environment. And so I think that is a really interesting development because uh, it, it allows to really have not only a holistic approach in our supply chains, which has been discussed, but also have a, a holistic approach to the, the, the SDG agenda and challenges that we envision. We need to have the enabling policy environment. We heard HRDD competition law, imported deforestation. We heard, heard about the uh, the UTP directive. So there's a number of, of, of policies and, and instruments that, uh, that we need to look at in this discussion uh, as well. If we really, uh, because I believe that's what we need to do, if we really want to be able to put market dynamics at the service of our sustainability ambitions. No, indeed, Ashal, I think that's a, that's a very, that's, that's quite a good uh, conclusion. Um, in terms of uh, questions, I see a lot of questions are still uh, being asked, but it's already one o'clock, uh, unfortunately. I also see that lots of questions have already been answered right now with this interesting uh, discussion um, that we're having now. I can assure that all of the people that ask questions, we will uh, answer to your questions in writing uh, after the webinar. Perhaps just one question that hasn't really been discussed and that Paul already briefly um, adjusts. Uh, addresses um, in one of his interventions is about the proliferation of um, of you know of certifications um, that claim to do similar things and I uh, and I quote the question including retailer standards all putting more and more pressure on suppliers and producers and farmers to comply with standards and certifications that all have slightly different requirements at the same time are consumers still evaluating these certifications. Uh, perhaps that's a good question to try and answer right now. Um, perhaps, I don't know, Karen, I, do you feel comfortable to perhaps, you know, coming in from a retail perspective to try and um, get an answer to this question about the proliferation of certification? Yeah, I think I can only agree eh, what what Paul is referring to. It's um, substantiated by many studies that most consumers um, don't know the difference between the labels. Even as a sustainability expert, um, it's sometimes difficult because you have the third party verified labels, but you have also our different suppliers all have their different programs. And we have tens of thousands of products on shelf. So that's, um, yeah, I think the proliferation of, of labels, it's not a good thing. And I think that's it's also the point Charlotte made. I think um, what can really raise the bar in a sector is joint objectives you have to reach this 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 with very clear kpis and give some liberty in how you reach it and then you can maintain a liberty of approaches but then the end goal is is clear in a in a sharp kpi yeah. thank you are there any more reactions on this uh this proliferation of labels no uh, Marika? Yeah, it may, maybe from a producer perspective, because as we already said, we have no bargaining power. What we have seen in the last four or five years, that to sell one box of bananas to the market, we need three, four, five certifications, more or less asking for 
similar uh, things that could be covered by one uh, and ending up with more and more costs. So I think certification is not for free, certification is costly. Um, and I think there need to be some agreements around this because uh, our organization are managing a huge amount of certification that on itself is unsustainable. Okay, thank you. Um, nobody else who wants to react to that question anymore? Then there was also an interesting uh, remark uh, and a suggestion, um, and I quote, don't we need a European or a global initiative for sustainable bananas setting a minimum price and a living income wage as objectives to be reached in 2030? Perhaps Paul being active in the World Banana Forum and et cetera, perhaps it's a question that you could uh, could take if you don't mind. Um, yeah, sorry. Can you just refresh my, what was the question again? It's about uh, the setting up or the possibility to setting up a European or a global oh, yes. initiative for sustainable uh, yes. banana. Yeah, sorry, yes, I did read that question. Um, I, I think my initial reaction to that is in, 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 in theory um, and in principle, yes, it would be a great idea. I think the difficulty would be how you politically achieve that um, uh, 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 and, and really goes to the same sort of issues I was raising about whether we introduce some sort of uh, market intervention, some changes to, to, to Europe-wide competition rules, for example. Um, it, 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 it's, um, it's a political political issue, but certainly, um, yeah, certainly in theory, philosophically, yes, it would be one way of, 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 of achieving that. And as I say, I mean, it's, it's a little like um, I, I was kind of alluding to that there are kind of different initiatives, uh, both voluntary le legislation initiatives and what have you, that are all kind of driving things in the right direction. And yes, if something like that were, were, were possible, we'd certainly be um, uh, 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 in support of some of that sort of measure, yes. Thank you. And perhaps, Shaila, you also have an idea about this, you know, with the different ESCOs, you're also increasingly working together and etc. And perhaps you also have some ideas on what lessons could be drawn uh, from this exercise from, you know, regarding bananas. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kuhn. And I would agree with Paul here uh, that in principle, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, I'm also a believer in the European Union. Uh, and I think that more and more when we're living in a globalized world, right, and so for a lot of, uh, of actors, the market is not purely Belgian, but the market is broader than that and, and goes, beyond, uh, goes beyond national borders, and so it would make a lot of sense. On the other hand, I'm also very pragmatic uh, and I like to start where the energy lies, uh, and so there's sometimes more energy in one uh, region of Europe than in another, and so I'm also happy uh, with, you know, the, the, the way the cocoa initiatives have, have been set up. Huh? So we, we now see that uh, I think that the German was the first one, I think back in 2012 already, uh, then followed by Belgium and Switzerland in 2018. Uh, a Dutch initiative popped, popped up in 2020. And at the end of last year, a French initiative popped up. I know that there might be some, uh, some discussions in, in other countries as well. So it's interesting to see. Uh, that that this works as well, huh? having one or a small group uh, of ambitious uh, national initiatives that also decide from the start to 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 intensify their collaboration and make sure that there's alignment so that we can somehow be the front runners in Europe in the hope, of course, that this movement gains traction and and, uh, and can in the end maybe why not become a European movement. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I already see it's uh, it's ten past uh, one, and I also see that people are uh, gradually disconnecting from <laughs> from the webinar. Uh, so I suggest we leave it uh, at this for now. Um, but uh, to all of the attendees, I, I we will make sure that you will get answers to your questions in writing uh, after um, the the webinar so we will definitely send them to you the webinar was also recorded in case you want to uh watch it again so i would like to thank all of the speakers uh, marika paul stan charlotte thank you so much and also the panelists karen boris natalie uh, and frank very very a very big thank you uh to your participation also my colleagues who facilitated and helped out behind the screens uh, my thank you so much uh for making this work 
Uh, and I think we succeeded in our goal at raising the issues um, on, you know, the human costs related to uh, low cost bananas. Um, we also showed how fair trade can be um, at least part of the responses. And I hope this can also be a sort of a call for uh, to to think together and jointly as a, a sector how we can do things. We can make things better uh, in Belgium and set up a sector-wide uh, initiative. So thank you all very much for having joined uh, today and um, looking forward to what's next for Bananas. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.